How far can you bend a music genre before it breaks? In 2014, the experimental electronic music collective known as Death's Dynamic Shroud would drop an album titled Virtual Utopia Experience. Virtual Utopia Experience is a very, very special album. The project takes an extremely interesting direction to what can be done within the confines of what we collectively assume a genre is, and how close one can get to the sun without falling in entirely. Let's dive in. If this is your first time here at the channel and you love exploring all things fascinating about music, make sure you click that subscribe button and turn all notifications on so you never miss a future video. While you're at it, throw a like on the video and perhaps share it with a friend. Doing so helps out the channel so much and always brings some much deserved attention to these artists and their music. So many would identify or recognize the Death Dynamic Shroud discography as Vaporwave. If someone was to ask what kind of music is Death's Dynamic Shroud, that easy answer most people will give is just Vaporwave. The Vaporwave scene over the years has evolved from a set music, art, and even meme culture focused on specific characteristics like computer-related imagery and consumer capitalism to what now seems to be just this gigantic melting pot of ideas, styles, and personalities. While many artists aim to break free from a genre they find themselves identified as being seemingly forever connected to, Virtual Utopia Experience's blend of cynical undertones and the live instrumentals conjures up a project that plays with the tools expected within a release under the Vaporwave umbrella, all while teasing the boundaries of leaving the genre deliberately. With a brand new gorgeous vinyl release of VUE on 100% Electronica, I thought there would be no better time than now to explore this fantastically emotional, spiritual, cosmic, and important release by the trio that I always get recommended to talk about on this channel. I'll also be joined in this video by James Webster himself, the member of Death's Dynamic Shroud who worked on this project solely, to get an inside look on the release and where it stands now in the present day. With all that being said, sit back, get cozy, and let us explore the anti-vaporwave vaporwave virtual utopia experience. Known for their bombastic breaks, mind-numbing stutter chops, and convincing ability to flow between luscious and horrifying in just a matter of seconds, Death's Dynamic Shroud and its three members, James Webster, Tech Honors, and Keith Rankin, have had the power to evolve what it means to make a Vaporwave project. There is an album or mixtape for everybody in the DDS catalog, but Virtual Utopia Experience takes the cake as being one of the most gargantuan releases of them all. Because it's kind of a, one of my personal uh, favorites out of the DDS albums that just I've worked on um, exclusively. Um, and that's because it, it has kind of a, a complicated history. Um, it sort of came at a time when we were really rolling with DDS and uh, I had a moment of cynicism as I, as I often do, um, where I was thinking critically about sampled music and um, instruments and, and playing music and all these various themes that I've been struggling with since the beginning of Death Dynamic Shroud, when I sort of abandoned my um, Puritan stance against sampling and started just doing whatever I wanted. While many Death's Dynamic Shroud projects set out to focus on a single theme or emotion and then entirely devour that premise, Virtual Utopia Experience is one of their more open-world creations. VUE has many faces and colors, and its oceans flow through all things heavenly and ecstatic to mystifying and ominous. The album contains a freedom you may not find with other DDS releases like Regret's Tragic Atmosphere, The Neverending Aquatics of SeaWorld, and the look at a social media and self-image crazed mind on classroom sex tape. And not that I am saying that these three are not as well made as Virtual Utopia Experience or anything like that, but these projects are so focused on chaining you down to one entire theme or emotion that it makes it seem like they're expansion packs or DLC to the Death's Dynamic Shroud name, while a release like Virtual Utopia Experience explores a whole new world entirely. Released on November 8th, 2014, 
Virtual Utopia Experience was a major release in the DDS discography that further established the Death's Dynamic Shroud sound and aesthetic we would know of today. The album erupts with its opening track, Open Me, this shiny jingle that feels like a Disney VHS tape revving up, only for it to lead into lost echoing vocals and James's ancient acoustic guitar playing that lights the dark and empty room we find ourselves in. We continue onward into tracks like Bow and Arrow, with its alien-like vocals and warping sound effects, still all blended into James's guitar work at the forefront. Plaza Wind comes up next, a more conscious Vaporwave track consisting of two video game sample flips that just work perfectly with one another. Chili synths and sleigh bells in the first couple of seconds placing you into a winter wonderland, ripping a quick nights into dream sample, only for it to suddenly fade out and open the door into one of the most beautiful, sweetest sounding sample change-ups you can find in all of the DDS discography. That beautiful Final Fantasy tune that revs up, this romantic dance of climbing flutes, rustic horns, and bongos, it all just hits the spot so well. And for those like me who have never played Knights or Final Fantasy XIV, these tracks I'm sure take on a completely different meaning compared to those who can spot the sample at first glance. I remember hearing Plaza Win for the first time and just falling in love with that transition from the opening jingle to the main sample exfoliated throughout the entire song. And so actually you, you can hear it in those first couple of tracks. You know, I intended this album basically to be sample free initially. Um, I kind of wanted to make like a freak folk album or like a just some kind of psychedelic um, acoustic driven album that used some editing techniques from Vaporwave. Um, and so the opening words of that second track, you know, sometimes it's better. The completion of that thought, which never actually made it onto the album, was like, sometimes it's better to play an instrument uh, instead of just sampling something else. And I was trying to show that actually in Open Me, the first track, when it's a very, very simple um, melodic line um, that I'm playing on the acoustic guitar. This the dum 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 da 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 da. Um, but every single time I played it, I varied the speed and I varied the way that um, the intensity of the notes and the velocity of the notes and um, I wanted it so that every single time that that phrase happened in that song it was um, being expressed in a completely different way and I think that the cynical point that I was trying to make was well here's something that you can't just get from looping and slowing down video game music necessarily uh, here's a a way to speak directly from the soul and transmit it through an instrument in sort of the ancient way or whatever. But of course it's just on top of, you know, um, a fully cooly um, radio drama with a bunch of reverb on it. So at, at the same time it was sort of very vaporwave in its execution. The fourth track, Cosmic Songwriter, continues with these ethereal flows. Psychedelic guitars layering over one another to create an infinite effect a perfect representation of the never-ending red sky present on the artwork. Death's Dynamic Shroud is always known for barraging you with an abundance of sounds, jolts of samples and instruments hitting you from all different directions, and this track right here may be the very best example of that on this album. It's full of life and color. It's a floating, glowing ball of energy you just want to catch and hold in your hand. As the track progresses and inches closer towards its conclusion, its energy and glow begins to dissipate, only for it to land face first onto track 5, TTFNK, another one of these distant, quaint, psychedelic folk pieces that questions the project's connection to what Vaporwave was entirely. Someone outside of the Vaporwave genre may hear the track TTFNK and think of it as nothing more than like a lo-fi acoustic track, but to those who follow the Vaporwave scene, DDS just gets thrown into that classification of Vaporwave anyways, and James ran with that concept. So what did it really mean to be punk? Well, what does it really mean to be Vaporwave? Well, call your album Virtual Utopia Experience and make a CGI cover, and, you know, is that it? Is that all it takes? Um, because there are definitely some songs on there that are straight up, you know, I mean, there's, there's a song where I'm just playing We'll Meet Again by Vera Lynn, and it's really just a lo-fi acoustic guitar and um, vocal cover of that song. So if, you know, if we just call it TTFNK, 
instead of we'll meet again, you know, cover, uh, and then throw it on an album called Virtual Utopia Experience, well, maybe that's enough. Um, but in the end, that didn't really work all the way. Uh, when I was done with the album, I wasn't really satisfied with the way it sounded, so um, that's when Plaza wins and uh, Screenshot Folder and some of the more kind of um, more familiar vaporwave tropes sort of made it onto the album. Um, and they really ended up completing it, I feel. And so what you end up with is very much a anti-vaporwave album as much as it's a vaporwave album um, without a doubt. I've shed light on this classification concept in previous videos on the channel, this weird spot many artists can find themselves in after creating an album or two that has become an essential or classic in a specific online music space. We see it all the time with vaporwave artists that, let's say, have released an album earlier in their discography that has become synonymous with the very roots of the vaporwave genre, or maybe released a project on a label known primarily for their vaporwave releases, or maybe even was featured on a project led by a vaporwave artist. All of these just potentially leading the artist to constantly be synonymous with the now vaporwave identity. And this can be looked at as a good or a bad thing. There is no right or wrong answer in my opinion, and it all comes down to how you feel about your output as a creator and how you feel about how others judge your work. When people throw a genre tag on your music, despite whatever direction you aim to take it in, it's only a word at the end of the day, and maybe you can play it to your advantage. Death's Dynamic Shroud has always been a great example of a collective that takes advantage of this genre classification a blend of tried and true tropes that Vaporwave fans would love, all mixed with something out of left field. Virtual Utopia Experience being Exhibit A. Um, but you know, one of the other major points I was trying to make with the album was uh, how much, how far could you push the genre? Or how, you know, how different could you make something sound and have it still be accepted as Vaporwave? Um, because Vaporwave really isn't, you know, Vaporwave is like punk, not in, not in the way that it's just like another way to say F you, but it's like, you know, well, what does punk sound like? Does punk sound like the Dead Kennedys? Does punk sound like The Clash? Does punk sound like UK subs? You know, like all, does punk sound like Blondie, the, the Sex Pistols, the Ramones, you know, all these different bands sound pretty much nothing alike, but we're all accepted as, you know, punk. Before we continue this video, I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to everyone who supports me over at Club Chennington and Patreon. It will always be my dream to be able to do this full time one day, and becoming a patron not only gives you a bunch of exclusive content like access to our patron only Discord server Club Chennington, but ultimately helps keep the channel going. If you are interested in becoming a patron today, the link is in the description of this video down below. Thank you so much, and let's journey forward. Getting into the meat of the album, Intermission to Mars hits us as a glitchy interlude. What starts off as a bunch of signal hopping and cruddy transmissions that beg for any sort of connection at all, all turns into a clear, sunshiny day. Heavenly piano keys, foggy horns, and glistening harps reveal to us in blinding light. After a couple of minutes, you are warped once again into Virtual Jungle, track number seven. Pockets of rushing water and chirping birds knit themselves through bubbly bass synths and sharp jumpy pads. And from Virtual Jungle, we are warped again to the shoreline, track number eight, which follows suit with more relaxing, floaty, and spa-like vibes. That reverb-soaked and delayed guitar becoming a magic carpet ride for your ears as you fly over golden brown sun-blasted islands. James abandons the expected vaporwave formula, especially at the time in 2014, by hopping from various moods and settings created by sampling and live instrumentation. This blend of self-produced material and sample manipulation, all with a direction to deliberately attack the project with and without a vaporwave state of mind, gave James a product that provided a refreshing world-building experience for the listener, and a quest that didn't just focus on video game aesthetics, old soul flips, or corporate big city soundscapes, which is what we saw a plenty of in the early years of the vaporwave scene. So it was just more kind of experimentation and the album really developed organically out of that. Um, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to release it on Atlantis Recordings, since, you know, they were the label that really sort of first saw Death Dynamic Shroud um, and, and first kind of took a chance on us. 
I don't know, it just really seemed to, to fit um, on a, uh, a record label that was, you know, named after an evasive species of tree. Um, that's kind of how I felt uh, Virtual Utopia Experience sort of fit into the, the narrative of Vaporwave. I want to shift gears for a little bit before we get into the latter parts of the album and showcase the vinyl release of Virtual Utopia Experience. I was super lucky to have bought one of these when I did. The vinyl dropped with two different variants, the Sunset Vinyl and the Blue Vinyl. The Sunset is now long sold out, but I do believe a couple of copies are still left for sale of the Blue variant. So for those who want to add another piece of the DDS lineup to their collection, or for those who just want to maybe take a shot in the dark and try out a new sound and experience, definitely check out 100% Electronica if you want to scoop up a copy for yourself. Being able to hold James's gorgeous 3D render artwork on a vinyl jacket, that's one thing, but being able to display it on my wall as a gigantic poster, that's another thing. I love when labels add little extras to their releases, and if any vinyl record release deserved a poster attached to it, Virtual Utopia Experience is the one. This 2x3 foot poster is crystal clear, sharp, and screaming with color. And talking about the color on the vinyl itself, the mock-up on the site did not do it justice. For real, this Sunset vinyl variant is so strong and vivid. Sounds great as well. Just a stellar job from James and 100% Electronica. But as far as this uh, release is concerned, uh, the poster, I think, is the coolest part about it because George just let me... I just had the idea like, hey, what if it came with a poster? And uh, George was super cool and was just like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Um, and he let me design this poster, which is very much inspired by uh, kind of the old Radiohead posters I used to have up in my room, you know, when I was uh, 18 or whatever. Um, I just love all the, the typography um, and all those like turn of the millennium Radiohead posters and that's really where the inspiration came from with just a smattering of uh, whatever lyrics you might uh, find on the album. Heading into the final third of Virtual Utopia Experience, the track Gift Shop cozies us in as a resting spot perhaps a chance to maybe take a moment to ourselves and regain our HP. A succulent, reverb-drenched sample loop that continues on for four minutes. It's heavenly, it's mesmerizing, it's some good old easy listening vaporwave. Song number 10, Screenshot Folder, is a simple track that chugs on through with nothing but a piano. James playing with various speeds and stretched textures has you imagining those notes from the piano to be nothing but tiny metal pins floating in an infinitely dark space. Screenshot folder feels so lonely, all while feeling so enormous and expansive at the same time. The longest track on the album, Blue Blue Resort, comes on next and returns to earlier moods present on the project with drowned out vocals and James's acoustic guitar. Another track that could be seen as something more of a psychedelic folk or acoustic piece instead of a vaporwave track. And last but not least, the album concludes with Hallway a track that features a weeping violin waving goodbye to you as you venture through the final hallway of the Virtual Utopia experience. For those who have not yet dove into the DDS discography, I highly recommend you do so. Virtual Utopia experience is a great place to start if you don't feel like going in the chronological order of releases. Its open world freedom and non-traditional vaporwave structure provide a blissful and entertaining experience for any palette and sets the stage for the grand aesthetics we expect in any Death's Dynamic Shroud release. Please let me know in the comments below of any other albums, artists, or genres you would want to see me explore in a future video. Anyways, until next time, stay safe and keep on listening to and sharing good music. We'll talk soon. Much love, your boy, Pad Chennington.